Look at here, Pete. I mean, Mr. Brooks. All human initiative must have a spark plug. And what is it? I'll tell you. It's the hope of a just reward for honest effort. That's the fuse on the firecracker. That's what built this country. Isn't this country good enough for you? Well, why don't you say something? Ah, because you know I'm right. And you want to know something else? I certainly do. What in the world are you talking about? I want a raise. Oh, is that all? I thought you were running for public office. How about it, Pete? Will you give it to me? A raise, I mean? Listen, nobody can give anybody anything. If you want more money or I want more money, we've got to earn it. Now, this is a good business, Mike, a mighty good business, if we're willing to put in what it takes. You've got your percentage set up. You can give yourself a raise any time you're willing to earn it. Okay, what do you want me to do, huh? Well, you've got to be quick on your feet. Use your head. It's the early bird, you know, that... What do they think of next? I sold a tire today. Well, I sold a tire. I sold plenty of tires. But I didn't have to write a book about it. Hey, ah, uh, that's what's the matter. Too many people sitting around telling other people how to run their business. Do you wish I could write a book or something? I gotta have more dough. Well, why don't you step out and sell a flock of tires? In a little while, you could retire and live on your commissions. Looks easy here. Sure, and then maybe you could tell somebody else how to do it. Maybe he might even try it sometime. Maybe he did. Yeah? Are you trying to tell me that he knows more about running my business than I do? I didn't say that. We got tires, haven't we? Somebody comes in and needs one, we give it to him, don't we? Well? I only said maybe this guy knows something about it. Gee, Pete, don't get sore. Who's getting sore? Now, look, Mike, calm down. You're just a little bit excited. When you've been around as long as I have, you'll learn that those trick gags don't work in a spot like this. This territory is different. I'll get him. Maybe I'll try the book on it. May I help you? Yeah. Got a 616 tire? Why, uh, yes, I think so. Uh, an atlas. All I care is if you got my size. Just blew one down the road away. Lucky thing I wasn't killed. Well, let me take a look. Just a minute. Okay. Pete! Hey, Pete! Yeah? What do you have? Never mind. Oh, you read that book once and you think you're a super salesman. Trying to sell a tire to the first guy that stops. This is our first line, 616. I guess it's all right. Not a bad kid at that. Very smart enough. Take it easy. You don't have to knock yourself out just because you. What's this? Come here, 616, too. Well, you kind of got my hands full. Maybe I don't see so good. Oh, that's all right. Open it up, will you, Pete? So that's how it is. Pete, old boy, you're going for a ride. Selling. That's the idea. Baloney. That green folding stuff's not baloney. That's money. What'd you do? Hit him over the head with the book? Mm, not exactly. Without even looking, I'll bet that I know every selling trick in that book. Sure, Pete. But this shows how to aim your selling. Sell on purpose instead of by accident. Okay, Mr. Wise Guy, suppose you tell me. Well, Pete, gee, don't get sore. It's... It's just that, well, I sold a tire today. Oh, 
So now we're playing games, huh? All right, we'll play it out. The full nine innings. An inning a day. If you beat me, you get more dough. If you don't... Wait a minute, Pete. You asked for it. Well, what do you say? I was just wondering, what's Mary going to say? What can I say? You stuck your neck out and he hung a wreath on it. It was a gag. I was just joking with Pete. Oh, and very funny, too. Oh, Mike. First it was to be last June, then October, then this June. Always just as soon as you got more money. I know, Mary. Well, he's giving you your chance. Why don't you grab it? I know, but shucks. I'm willing to do anything. Put in longer hours, anything. But when it comes to getting out and selling... Selling? Selling? What's this? Uh, keep your seat, my boy. I just want to get something to read. Uh, <clears throat> I understand you're getting out and selling? Well, that is, uh... Fine, fine. Salesmanship, I've always said, is the mainspring of commerce. Fuse are the firecracker of progress. Here we go again. Papa, Mike knows all about that firecracker. It turned out to be a dud. Fine, fine. Nothing was ever achieved without salesmanship. Every new idea, every meritorious product must be sold. Yes, Papa, we know. Now, uh, speaking of uh, sales experience of more than a score of years, I might say, uh, what's your territory? How big is your expense account? Well, this is a little different. Splendid, splendid. And now, my boy, the first rule of uh, sales success is dominate the situation always. Be a master. Command. All right, Commander. The dishes, remember? Uh, yes, of course, my dear. I was just coming. As I was saying... Yes, I know. Right now. Very well, my dear. You didn't have to come after me. He was coming out anyway. I never could spout talk the way he does. Thank goodness. There was none of that high-pressure stuff in the book. What's this book you keep talking about? Oh, something that came in the mail. Sort of the boiled-down experience of dealers who've been successful in selling tires. That sounds as though it ought to be good. Yeah, I know. Maybe I'm in the wrong racket. Gosh, I hate to ask anybody to let me sell them something. I noticed that. Huh? Listen, Mike, I don't know anything about business, but I'm sure that nobody wants to be sold anything. No matter whether it's a drugstore, a hat shop, or a fish market, the good salesmen are the ones who make you want to buy. But that's not like pumping gas. Then the guy comes in and says, give me five. You give it to him and... That... And the only difference between you and a slot machine is you're prettier. <laughs> oh, Mary, you don't know anything about selling in a service station. Well, that makes two of us. But just by looking at some stations, I can tell that somebody must know how to sell. Oh, you talk like that book. Maybe it's time you did, too, if you have any plans for our future. By the way, where is this book of yours? I guess I left it at the station. Gosh, I hope Pete doesn't read it or it's goodbye ball game. Hmm. That's not so dumb at that. Nothing I didn't know, of course, but it all adds up. Yeah, that's all right. Let's see. One to nothing. Getting a little low in some sizes. Better do something about that. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Tomorrow, I'll get out that tire rack and I'll spring a driveway display on that smarty pants. <laughs> yeah, I guess that'll open his eyes. The quart of number 20 will bring it up to a safe level. Okay, fill it up. Yes, sir. Are 
I said, okay, fill it up. Oh, oh yes, sir. yes. Am I supposed to pay for this, or is it on the house? Oh, well, uh, thank you. Uh, will you come back? Hi, Pete. You know, I had an idea. You had an idea, this? Sure. Set it up where the drive-ins can see it. Regular silent salesman. More of that monkey business out of that book, huh? Well, wait a minute. This is sure fire. Helps to open tire selling conversation. Gives the customer a chance to feel it and taste it and smell it. And that's just what I think of your idea. It smells. Will you get over to Mrs. Bentley's and pick up that car for the lube job? Okay, Pete, sure, but I didn't think you'd get sore. Nobody's sore. Mrs. Bentley's waiting. Okay, okay. Hello, Mike. Mrs. Bentley? Thanks. I'll have it back by one o'clock. That'll be fine, thanks. Am I all set, Pete? What? Oh. Yes and no, Miss Edwards. I'd like you to see something. Hmm, what's the matter? Well, take a look at that front tire. You know, that's, uh, that's just asking for trouble. Why, Pete, there's a lot of mileage left in some of us old-timers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we don't have to take that kind of abuse. Excuse me a minute, I want to show you something. <laughs> you know, Maybe you've got two or three thousand miles left in those tires, maybe more. But they're the most expensive miles in any tire. What are you talking about? They hold up the car, don't they? Well, after a fashion. Now, here's about the way your tire looks in cross-section. You see how thin that rubber is? Hit a stone or a car track and wham! That whole shot goes right to the cord body. And when you least expect it, blew it. Oh, come, Pete. I'm a pretty careful driver. I know you are. But even a careful driver picks up bits of glass and tacks and pieces of wire. And with that tread, even a little carpet tack would go right through it to puncture your tube. Hmm, yeah, I suppose so. And of course, it always happens at the worst time, on your way to keep a business date, or maybe to take the family out. And even at best, changing a tire across a cleaner's belt. And probably a new tube. <laughs> you make it sound pretty serious. Well, it was to Joe Martin. One rainy night, some old duff had turned suddenly into a driveway. Joe slept on his brakes. His tires were about like yours are now. So he slid right along and hit a light pole. Of course, he wasn't going fast, so all it cost him was a radiator grill, a bumper, one light, and a fender. That's all. Of course, it could have been a lot more serious. Suppose Mrs. Martin had been driving the car. Oh. Yeah, it could have been a lot more serious. I'd like you to look at this Atlas tire. Isn't that a honey? Oh, I suppose it is. Just press your hand down on that tread. You feel that tread grip? Say, it does it that. Ah, that's real non-skid protection for you. Look at the depth of that tread. Mm -hmm. And how flat. And look at the amount of tread on the road. Spreading the weight and spreading the wear. You can see that this tire was designed for more mileage and safer mileage. Now, honestly, Miss Edwards, wouldn't you feel a lot safer if you had one of these on each wheel, especially with Mrs. Edwards driving the car? Well, of course, Pete, but I... Uh... And the best part of it is this extra protection really costs you nothing. Hmm. Well, I... Uh... I can put them on for you in no time at all. Oh, no. No, thanks, Pete. Not right now. Oh, Mr. Edwards, 
You just name any tie you can think of and sack it up against an atlas, and I can prove to you. I'd rather not discuss it now. Goodbye, Pete. Goodbye, Miss Edwards. My criminy, if ever a set of tires was sold, they were. And still, the guy said no. So, he was sold right up to the teeth. Why didn't he buy? Why? Why didn't I ask him why? Oh, nuts. Hey, Pete, if you want, I'll put away that tire display. What for? What's the matter with it? Well, I thought that... Oh, you... leave it alone. Keep the tires in front of our customers. Start selling conversation. Oh, sure. Say, Pete, when are you going to bat? Huh? Oh, that I hadn't thought about it. Catch that, will you? Okay. He can hardly wait to get gas in the tank before he starts his pitch on tires. Let him get his hands on it. Put it in his mitts. Let him feel it. Oh, you bird brain. And look at those non-skid edges. To cut through scum or water, wipe the road clean and grab hard. It's a funny thing, but you can actually feel that tread grip. Now, just press down on that with the palm of your hand. Why, George, you can with that. That's real non-skid protection. Deep, too. Oh, well, it looks like a lot of miles. Now, if that monkey messes that up again... You bet. That's the reason we can give you the Atlas written warranty. Stick with him. That's the boy poor mine. Well, I really hadn't intended buying today. Now's when you need this protection most. And I can have him on for you in a jiffy. Well, will you take a check? Right on the button. A knockout. Hey, Pete, we can take his check, can't we? It means two tires. We can take it, can't we? Oh, I suppose so. For two tires and tubes. Tubes? Well, oh, great snake, you're not going to put old stretch tubes into new casings, are you? New tubes are just common sense. Oh, yeah, sure. Give me those tubes. <laughs> That's not fair. He was only lukewarm till you handed him that tire. Let's split the deal. Don't be a boy, Scott. Well, look here. All right, all right, Rollo. Look, I'll take an assist on the play, and you get an error. The score stands, but don't get too cocky. The ball game is still young. Mike, you will clean out the inside of the car, will you? Sure, Pete. I'll deliver it on my way home to supper. Okay. I'll catch him. Here, wait a minute. That's Mr. Edwards. I got a little unfinished business with him. Wait a minute, Mr. Edwards. That's my job. Oh. Well, you're busy. I didn't want to bother you. Oh, we're never too busy to take care of a good customer. By the way, we... 
we inflated these tires just the other day, didn't we? Yeah, I know. That tube doesn't seem to hold air like it should. Uh-huh. Mr. Edwards, uh, I'd like to ask you something, sort of a personal favor. Oh, sure, go ahead, Pete. Well, the other day, I, uh, I tried to show you how you'd be better off every way by changing over to new rubber. I know that's right, but I guess I didn't get it across to you. I wish you'd tell me where I fell down on the job. Oh, come, Pete, it's not that bad. You've got a mighty good tire. In fact, it's really better than I need the way I drive. Down at the Auto Mart, I can buy tires as good as I need for a lot less money. In fact, even after I pay for mounting, I'd be quite a bit ahead on a full set. Oh, well, so that's it. What's the rest of this tire mileage worth? Well, I don't believe I understand. Mr. Edwards, I'm going to buy this unused mileage and put you on Atlas. And all that's less cost to you than those other tires would stand you. Now, what do you say? Well... You'll find pen and ink on the desk. I'll be with you in just a second, Mr. Edwards. Thanks. Come, come, lad. Stop puttering. Huh? Get out there and put four tires and tubes on Mr. Edwards' car. Four? Of course. And get a move on and bring the old tires in here. While Mike is changing over, let's fill out your warranty. Oh, all right. But if there was anything wrong with any of the tires, I guess you'd take care of it all right. So the warranty doesn't really mean much. Ah, but this one does. It goes beyond assuring you of getting perfect tires. Covers their performance on the road. All kinds of roads, wherever you drive. After all, what you're really buying is tire performance service. And this backs you up. Please. Four at one crack. Now the heat is on. Very pretty. Very pretty indeed. Pretty phony, if you ask me. We took in four clunkers that we got to get rid of. Listen, Sonny, most tire sales have to be made twice. The new tires that you put out and the used tires that you take in. And the payoff comes in making a profit on both. Okay, okay. So those are just hits. Till you bring them in. Well, of uh, course. Say, with your brass-bound gall, you ought to take out a burglar's license. <laughs> And the following winter, I was up in the North Country. Cold? It was so cold that when people stopped to talk, their words actually froze and fell down in little piles of snow. Couldn't hear a sound. Then comes spring, and you'd start hearing those frozen conversations thawing out all up and down Main Street. Why, scientists came from all over. Uh, oh, oh, go away, boy. Scram, scram. Ah, Mr. Nichols, I believe. The Mr. Nichols, and looking slightly out of sorts. Stop that well, stubber and give me your cigar. Oh, dear me, a trifle vexed, perhaps? Shut up. Of course I'm mad. Five miles out in the country, bang, a practically new tire. Well, you don't say. So I take the tire and that pretty certificate back to this store. Do I get a new tire? Do I get compensated for the time I spent on my hands and knees changing it? I assume the answer is no. All I get is insulted. They say it wasn't the fault of the tire. I say, is it my fault that the tire blew out on a railroad crossing? They say the certificate covers workmanship and materials only, and I must buy a new tire at full price. And I say they can take their and tire... And I say that you're lucky you stopped in here. I happen to have an interest in a tire firm, or oh, in a modest way, of course, and I can swing a little weight and get you something pretty special. What kind of a jerk do they take me for? I'll show them. Somebody's going to pay for this. Oh, 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 somebody's going to pay for those cigars, two or three for a quarter. <laughs> What's your price, Mr. Nichols? So long. <laughs> Oh, Mike. Yeah? You've fallen behind. Huh? I say Pete's gotten ahead of you. Yeah, I know. He pushed those four runs in. What's that mean? Oh, he took in four used tires on one deal. I wouldn't let him count the runs till he sold the old ones. Did he? Yeah, the lucky stiff. Two of the casings were pretty thin, so he had them recapped. Sold them right off to, what's his name, that guy down at the express office. Showed a profit on the deal, too. Is that hard to do? Well, I guess not. Not if you know where to pedal them. Oh, I see. The other two really were too good for recapping, yet not good enough to sell as is. I thought he was stuck with them, sure. What happened? 
Well, old man Tisdale up on Willow Road came in town last night, bringing some eggs in and, as usual, shopping for bargains. He and Pete went round and round. I bet Mr. Tisdale wanted to trade eggs for tires. Sure, <laughs> but Pete just held out the cash. Got it, too, finally. Gee, Mary, it was funny. I wish you could be funny that way once in a while. Mary, look here. Oh, stop it, you idiot. Hey, what is all that? Oh, some stuff I picked out of the tires of the Hamlin car. All that? I bet Mr. Hamlin will be surprised. Oh, he won't even know about it. Hey, wait a minute. Maybe he ought to give us a chance to play up our service. Well, I should think so. At least I'd be impressed. Yeah, and another thing. Give us a chance to make him keep his mind on his tires. Make him think of us when he thinks of tires. And then someday, when he's ready for new tires... Sure, I'm going to put those where Mr. Hamlin's bound to see him. A swell idea. And right out of your great big brain, too. You know, that gives me another idea. Oh, Ray, two in the same day. When tires start to get old, you always see a lot of gouges and cuts. Doesn't the owner ever get a chance to see them? That's the point. He's in a hurry or we're busy and he usually gets away. Maybe we should mark him with rings of chalk or something. He'd notice them then. Sure, and ask questions. Then he'd be pitching right into our hands. Well, at least he'd realize that you had his best interest at heart. I know women would appreciate that. Oh, yeah, Mrs. Prentice was in today. I bet you you could have read a newspaper right through her tires. But do you think I could interest her in a deal for new ones? Mm -mm. Why not? I don't know, unless it's like Pete says, if she's a married woman and a regular customer, you've got to talk to her husband, sell him. Well, of course. She'd feel that buying anything as important as that for the car was up to her husband. So I suppose I should just clam up and not say a thing till I see the old man. Even if I could see the tubes right through the tread, fine thing. Well, it wouldn't hurt to talk about the advantage to her in having new tires. Make her want them. Then she'll work on her husband. Well, then, the old battle axe, why didn't she say so? What you don't know about women, dear, would fill a book I never want to read. Oh, Mary. <laughs> Are there chickadees? Well, that's just like old times. When I was courting your mother, we spent most of the evening holding hands. Yes, sir. Every time I let go, she hit me. <laughs> <laughs> Papa. <laughs> I thought you and Mother were going to the movies. Precisely, but it's a matter of business first. A deal of potential magnitude. I could use it. Mr. Fred Nichols, a friend of many years standing, had a regrettable tire experience the other day. I spoke to Fred on your behalf, my boy, and so of course the deal's yours for the asking. Oh, really? Say that's swell, thanks. Hey, I better get over and see him as soon as Pete comes back. Mm, just a formality, of course. Hey, Any time that old skin flim... Tut, 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 you're speaking about my friend. But you're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I'd better go to the movies with the folks. Oh, hey, wait a minute. Oh, we'll be home when the moon shines over the porch swing. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, sweetheart. <laughs> well, okay. Hi, folks. Oh, don't see how I am. I just passed Mary and her father. Why didn't she duck? I'm going to. I've got some business to attend to. Business? When I was your age, we had another name for it. All right, all right. That Hamlin Lube job's all set. He ought to stop by for it most any time. Okay. Well, evening, Mr. Nichols. I'm Mike Laird of Brook Service. Friend of Mr. Holmes. Never mind a pedigree. What do you want? Well, I came to talk to you about tires. Tires? Come in here, young fella. I'm going to tell you something about tires. What's the angle on this? What's that, Mr. Hamlin? This envelope. I found it in my car. It says, I picked this out of your tires while inspecting them, but they're all okay. ML. Oh, oh, sure, that. Uh, that's just part of our regular service. Mm, good service, too, I'd call it. Well, it does help your tires give better service. Little idea that I, uh, that we thought up. Say, that's all right. You know, you fellas ought to be taking care of my father-in-law's cars. Your father-in-law? Don't believe I know him. Doc Bamford. He's a darn good physician, but what he knows about cars, you could put in your eye. He's got two cars, and most of the time, both of them need something. 
Right now, they could both use some new tires, the way he has to drive. Well, we could take mighty good care of him. Thanks. Yes, I'm sure you could. But it wouldn't do any good for me to try and send him over here. He'd just forget. You'll have to try and dig him out at his office. I'd be glad to, first thing in the morning. Fine. Well, good night, Pete. Good night, Mr. Hamlin, and thanks a lot. That's a crazy effect. So, as near as I can figure out, that certificate holds good only so long as the tire stays on the shelf. It didn't mean a thing after he got on the road. Yeah, that's not so good. Not so good, he says. Why, well, I've been robbed. There ought to be a law. There is, in a way. It's sort of the law of common sense. Atlas has had it in its warranty for years. Here, I'd like you to take a look at it. I don't care how pretty it is. What's it mean? What's it going to do for me? That's what I want to know. Let's put it this way. Ours gives you all the protection against possible manufacturing or material defects. Sure, but the point but the is... The warranty doesn't stop there. It goes on to cover the tire's performance on the road. Never mind the fancy talk. Suppose I buy your tire. I'm not saying I'm going to, but suppose I do. But after a couple of months, suppose the tire just fails. What then? Under the Atlas warranty, you're still protected. You just pay for the satisfactory mileage you've already used and get a new tire free. Now, wait a minute, young fella. You say I just pay for the mileage I've had? That's right. Suppose the tire's maybe six or seven months old. Still pay only for the mileage used. Suppose I'm in another county or another state when it happens. I have to come all the way back to you, eh? No, sir. Any Atlas dealer anywhere can fix you up in five minutes. And there are more Atlas dealers around the country than any other kind. Hmm. Is this something new? Not with us. When you come right down to it, we're not just in the gas and oil business or the tire and battery business. We're in the better motoring business. And as long as we can give you better motoring for your money, we'll do all right. Well. Sounds so crazy, it makes good sense. We found it does in the long run. Now I'd like to show you how and why Atlas tires will stand up and perform for you just as well as they do for millions of others. Just a minute, just a minute. What's the idea? I just sold a tire and the score is tied. Hmm. I didn't hear any money hit the till. I collect when I put on the tire tomorrow. Oh, sure. And that's when you mark up your score. And you talk about a burglar license. Well, there you are, Mr. Nichols. There's one tire you can depend on for a long time to come. We'll see. You'll find I'm right. 10, 15, 20,000 miles from now. You'll know what we mean by Atlas stand-up performance. Mm. That remains to be proved. No, Mr. Nichols, that's already proved. See that tank wagon out there? Well, that and thousands like it, running day and night over all kinds of roads all over the country. They are proving how well Atlas tires can take it. And then there's the largest fleets of passenger automobiles in the world, operated by major oil companies, piling up millions of miles more proof every day. Mr. Nichols' Atlas tires had to make good with them. If they hadn't, they'd have dropped them like a hot potato. No wonder you can be so cocky with your warranty. Right, we're betting on a sure thing. That's the way to bet. Well, good day. Bye, Mr. Nichols. Hey, Mike. You want to sign for this? Can't find feet around anywhere. Say, I wonder where he did go. Well, I suppose I should understand all you're telling me, but frankly, I don't know what goes into tires, and I don't care. Well, Doctor, here's a tire that started from scratch, and in 10 years became one of the leaders. Indeed. People picked it, if you'll excuse the comparison, just as they'd pick a doctor, on reputation or the say-so of others. Atlas got its best advertising from its users. And that's mighty hard to beat. Hmm, well, that's very interesting. Well, I'll think over what you said, and uh, if I decide to uh, take your advice, I'll stop in and see you on my way home tonight. Well, is there anything that I haven't fully covered? No, no, you see, there's someone else. That is, there's other considerations. Someone else? Mm. Well, if it's a matter of... Now, please, I can't give it any more time now. Uh, of course, Doctor. Well, you know where to reach me. Yes, I have your card. Or I'll get in touch with you later. Yes, uh, perhaps I uh, will see you later. Goodbye, Doctor. Good day.
Put service station. Hiya, Pops. What's on the fire? A sheer bonanza, my boy. A bonanza? My old friend of many years standing, Dr. Bamford, stopped in at noon. I told him to do nothing till he's seen you personally. Two cars. That might mean eight tires. Maybe ten. Well, uh, the deal, uh, I might say, is clinched. Uh, that is, with certain trivial complications. The good doctor is considering trading in his cars in a few months. And then, too, some other tire peddler seems to be trying to put the bite on him. I don't know who it is. Uh-oh, competition, huh? Say, I'll get hot on that deal right away. Thanks, Pop. Hey, Pete, I'll be a little late coming back from lunch today. I got an errand to run uptown. Sure, sure, that's okay. Well, the duck's got to talk to somebody else. Oh, who in Sam Hill it could be? Eight new tires, maybe ten. Oh, boy, what a last inning rally that'd be. So when you come right down to it, you're not buying tires, really. You're buying mileage, safe, trouble-free mileage. And Atlas Tires, backed up by our kind of service inspection, give you most of your money. Well, there's something what you say, of course. However, there are other considerations. Of course, in the old days, sometimes it was considered wise to hold off by new tires until the car was turned in, but not anymore. Eh? Uh, that's so? A lot of folks have found out they could have all the benefits of new tires the last few months before trading in, and for free. Hmm, well, now that's hard to believe. It would seem to me, if I make my old tires last, that I'd be just that much ahead. Well, sir, let's look at it this way. The car dealer has to figure his trade-in allowance on a basis of what he can get for your used car on resale. Well, that's so, of course. And if your tires are shot, he knows he's got to replace them. So he has to cut down the trade allowance to allow for that. And so, in effect, I'm really paying for new tires in any case. That's right. And why should you be buying new tires for the next owner of your car? Goodness knows you're the one who needs them when you're racing the stork or answering some other emergency call. You put on good new tires now, and they'll still be new when you want to trade in. <laughs> By George, young man, that makes very good sense. A lot of our people have found that out. Now, Doctor, why don't I take your car back with me? No, no, no. You see, there's another man. Oh, my word, this, uh, this is embarrassing. But, Doctor, you can't expect just any new tire to give you the benefits we've been talking about. Oh, dear, now, let me see. Well, <laughs> give me your address. I promise I won't make any final decision until I have seen you again. Thank you, Doctor. Please be sure of that. It's really terribly important. Well, I certainly am beginning to think so. <laughs> the old horse and buggy days may have been slower, but they were a lot simpler. Goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye. And be sure and have that prescription filled. <laughs> well, this is becoming complicated. <laughs> well, it's interesting. Hey, Pete, you're on late tonight, aren't you? Of course I am. What of it? Well, I was going to say, why don't you get supper now? I'll hang around. I'm not hungry. Oh, I'm not hungry either. Matter of fact, why don't you take the rest of the night off and have some fun? Oh, never mind. I'll stick around. Lay off. He's mine. Yours like fun. That's Doc Bamford. I know he is. He's my customer. But I'm the fellow. Hey, wait a minute. Say, uh, are you the other guy? That was you? Well, what do you know? <laughs> Come on. This is a team operation. I still think you had most to do with it. You're the one who deserves the credit. Never mind the credit. I'm taking cash. Mike, and Pete did give you a raise. Honey, nobody can give anybody anything. I'm making money. Of course, we can't expect to hit the jackpot every day like we did with Doc Banford. But, baby, I'm getting the know-how of this business, and it's for me. We can't miss. Oh, Mike. In the bright lexicon of youth, my boy, there's no such word as failure. Hopes and ideas forged into something strong and fine by the fires of ambition may be irresistible by courage and determination spell success. If I'm not right, what am I? Huh? 
Well, I'll be doggone to walk out on me. <laughs> well, I will be doggone. <laughs> a lot of that, don't you? Yes, sir, but that's only part of the story. Look there. When we can sell that kind of a bill of goods to the hotshot Atlas dealer from Derber, you bet I'm proud of it. That's the certificate of merit and salesmanship. Nothing tops that. And as I get the story, Henry and his wife were on their vacation, sort of a delayed honeymoon. Yes, when they stopped in, all he wanted was to fill the radiator for free, but he wound up with that. <laughs> and there's nothing on that whole list that Henry didn't have right in his own station. <laughs> exactly. He had to come all the way to Center City to learn how to sell accessories to both sides of the family. Well, he learned, and his education cost him that thirty-nine fifty plus a darn good dinner. Well, you can be proud of your star pupil. Yes, sir. He's a grand guy. Don't come any finer. And he's a pretty sharp merchandiser, too. Top man in my territory. Yeah? You're kidding. Not in accessories, he isn't. In accessories, too. I don't believe it. Oh, well. Maybe just for one month. No, month after month. He's really up there. Of course, he always did have an edge on you in tires and batteries. Why, I, I, I don't understand it. There must be some mistake. Maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea if you paid him a little visit. Me? Me put myself in the hands of that pirate? Oh, he's not so tough. Well, after that? Huh. Turnabout's fair play. I can't believe it. I don't understand. Maybe I can give you a hint. Yes, what's the secret? Budget selling. Oh, that nuts. I've been offering time payments. Sure, Henry Morgan used to offer accessories, too. Well, of course, I may be wrong. But I've worked pretty hard to build up a quality operation. We sell service, tires, batteries, and accessories on the basis of a conscientious quality. We push credit cards. The big mass of budget customers don't qualify for credit cards. Sure, for good reason. But they drive cars. And if you make it easy for them to buy here... Okay, that's the worry end of the business. A man could spend all his time doing nothing else. He could push it so hard that he'd sell himself right out of business with nothing left but a lot of uncollected accounts. Mm, Henry Morgan seems to know how to make it work. Why not see how he does? Love to. Nothing I'd like better. Oh, no. Let Henry get the whip over my back? No, thanks. Well, if you should happen to change your mind... So long, Ned. First the sucker, then get smart. First get smart. Okay, but get smart. So long, George. So long. Yee-hoo, brother! The Wolf of Playland Park. Gangway girls, here comes Mr. Esquire. Now stick around, son. Maybe you'll learn something. Say, hey, pretty. Yeah, they're raffling him off at the country club. I'll lay off, you guys. <laughs> Funny part is, I just intended to get a hat. Then when I put the new hat on, well, the old suit looked sort of beaten up. So I went for a new suit. Before I knew it, I bought the works. Sure, but really, you don't have to wear the tag, you know. All you have to do is to tell people it's new. They'll believe you. <laughs> Look, boss. Oh, I wish I could afford that kind of class. Oh, you're kidding, aren't you? It only costs a buck or so more a week to buy good stuff. And like you're always preaching, quality is the best economy in the long run. Okay, okay, skip the sales talk. Now what'd I say? Search me.
Three stoplights in a row. Maybe you just ain't seeing red today. My friend, everything I see is red. You know, this is going to add up into quite a tidy sum. Maybe they'll let you pay it off on a budget plan. I'll take the ticket. You keep the bright remarks. Mr. Martin, Mrs. Martin said before I go, I'm to ask you if there's any of this junk you want to save. And then I'm to throw it all out anyway. Sure, sure, Tilda, throw it away. Just a minute. Here's something. Uh-oh. This takes me back to the old days with the Players Club. I'll just keep this. I knew it, I knew it. First, there's nothing. Then there's just a little something. And then there's everything. My, my, my. <laughs> ah, those were the days. Charlie's aunt, Uncle Tom's cabin, Angie the country girl, secrets of an opium den. That was pretty good, too. Say, I wonder... My boy, you can't marry that girl. She is your long-lost sister. Elementary, my dear Watson. The criminal entered with his shoes on backward. What? Me work and lose me professional standing? Now the class will please come to order. I wonder. Well, I might as well try it out anyway. Well, sir, you can buy cheaper tires, but Atlas tires cost you less by the mile. By the way, your face seems familiar. Possibly. It happens that I'm a school teacher. So perhaps you can understand why such a substantial outlay all at once is a very serious consideration. Well, you could pay for it on time. Some of our customers do, those who can qualify. Are these time payments difficult to arrange? Not so tough, just a little checking up. Why, Mr. Martin could fix you up in, say, a day or so. Very interesting. I'll consider it. Yeah, good night. Uh, perhaps we could start things through tonight. I'll call back when Mr. Martin is here. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Well, Henry Morgan, I'm all set for you. Tomorrow night, just about this time. That's three dollars and two is five. Thanks and come in again. You bet. Good night, Henry. Good night, Mr. Franklin. sure has gone all out for this budget selling. Well, here's hoping. Yeah, now, can't let you do that. I'd be out of a job. Oh, I usually do it myself. That tire isn't as young as it might be, and I have to take rather unusual precautions. Say, hey, you're right. That's like riding on a bomb. I know. I do have to be careful. But a new tire costs so much. Not nearly as much as driving that booby trap. Or every little piece of glass on the road or stone. Things that a new tire would laugh at is a real threat. Say, you're just as bad off here, too. Rears are all right, but those front tires... Oh, see here now, I'm quite aware of all the hazards involved. But new tires just now, well, they're quite out of the question. Do you smoke? No, thanks. Just toss one away. No, no, I mean, you really do smoke. Oh, yes, of course, but... How much? 
Oh, pack a day, maybe a little more. But really, I don't Look, see... Look, for no more than the little you spent for cigarettes each week, I'll put brand new Atlas tires and tubes on both those front wheels. Just cigarette money for only 12 weeks in exchange for a couple of years or more of Atlas driving. What do you say? Well, you do make it sound simple. Say, it's simpler than that. Come into the office. Now, uh, Mr. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Oh, uh, uh, Marshall. Oh, Marshall, yes. Uh, let me see, did you get one of our preferred budget privilege cards? Preferred what? Mm, I guess not. <laughs> well, there are a few questions, for the record. First, your full name? Uh, George L. Home address? I don't live at home. You know, uh, housing shortage. But you must live somewhere. I'm just moving, uh, out of a hotel. Oh, the LaSalle. Well, you'll still be there a while. I presume so. Are you employed by whom? I'm a school teacher. Where? Why, at the school. <laughs> Which one? Oh, the high school. How long? Oh, about five years. Let's see, your supervisor. Oh, that would be Mr. Evans, the principal. Yes, Mr. Evans. Wait a minute. It's Mr. Evans is superintendent of schools now. Oh, is that so? I wonder why I hadn't seen him around. Mr. Marshall, I'm not asking you these questions to embarrass you or pry into your affairs. It's just a matter of business, but it is business. Yes, of course. I'm sorry if I appear a bit vague. Uh, now it's for your bank. Merchant's Trust. Merchant's Trust. Mr. Marshall, we don't have a Merchant's Trust in Durba. Oh, it's where we used to live, <laughs> upstate. Uh, we, we never bothered to change. We like the people there. Mr. Marshall. Listen, who's doing what to who around here? Well, it was a good gag while it lasted. <laughs> George Martin, why, you rascal. Now, nah, look, don't go getting sore. It was only a joke. Sore? Who's sore? But what's the idea of the G-man get up? Just exactly that. Oh, riddles yet. Well, about a year ago, you paid me a visit. Before I knew it... You sold me everything but your lube guns, yeah. You also walked out with some good merchandising ideas, too. Oh, now I get it. So you figured you'd nosy around here and... Uh... Exactly. Might have done all right, too. But only worked up a little more background first. All right, son. Name it. What do you want to know? I get rumors. Probably nothing to them, of course. But I hear that you've been making some slight progress through budget selling. Well, we haven't done as much as we could, yet. Wait a minute. What you mean is that you found out we're trimming the pants off you and you want to find out how. Oh, come. I'll admit that we've been so busy with clean business that we haven't gone after the time payment accounts. You're not kidding anybody. You know as well as I do that those budget payment accounts represent practically half the potential market. You just hate to admit you can't land them the right way. I wouldn't admit anything to you. But how come that you've gone all out for this budget selling? You know, I asked you that question once about accessory selling. And you answered me by saying... Uh, it was the easiest and most profitable end of the business, I remember. Well, that's my answer on budget selling. Nonsense. With all the investigating follow-up and repossessions fully. Say what you will, they're definitely second-rate accounts. Maybe that's your trouble. You think of them as just accounts, but they're people. People who own automobiles, who would go without almost everything else to keep those cars running. People who could be your best customers. These are not just names. They're more than names. They're people, uh, customers of mine, friends of mine. That's Hartley Brown, junior bank clerk. Maisie Simmons, teacher school, and she knows the name of her principal. Joe Spellman, house painter. Jeff Harbert, he works for service plumbing. Look them over. But look them over as people, not just as names on cards. All right, so they're good, honest, hard-working folks. But they are in the low-income bracket. And still you figure they're just as good as the customers who have cash to lay on the line. That doesn't make sense. No, let me give you an example. Now, you take Mr. Phillips, who owns the service plumbing. Phillips is a customer of mine with plenty of that cash money to lay on the line. For weeks, I've been working to sell him a set of new tires. One day, he stopped in and... Uh, you know, Mr. Phillips, I feel like a heel every time I let you drive out of here on those old tires. Well, cheer up, Henry. I'm having a new set put on today. Well, thank goodness. That takes a load off my conscience. Now, do you want to leave the car here, or shall I have one that of the... That all depends, Henry. I'm buying my tires from the dealer who's willing to knock off 15% for a cash deal. 
Uh, can I give you my check now, or uh, do I have to go on up the street? All right. So what would you have done? Let him go. Like fun you would, and neither did I. Remember that deal, and I'm coming back to it. Now take Jeff here. Just another guy working for service plumbing. Over the past year, he bought a new set of tires and tubes from me. Did he squawk for a discount? On the budget plan, he paid me a bonus of over 10%. Now I leave it to you. Which is the better customer? I suppose that carrying charge makes up for any bad guesses on credit risks. The best way to be sure of a good credit risk is don't wait for them to come in. Go out after the good ones. There are any number of ways of checking up on the responsibilities of people. Pick the one you want, get them first before somebody else knocks them off. Send them a preferred budget privilege card. You know how many miles you've walked, how many doorbells you rang, just to get a service customer. Sending the cards is much simpler and more profitable. Well, I suppose a man is flattered when you let him know that you respect his credit. Sure, you've given him a little more dignity, made it easier for him to ask for a budget terms without losing face. Ah. And when he buys, you've got him coming for at least 12 weeks. You've got his car under constant inspection, and you can spot all his car needs first. Yes, there's something to that. Oh, it, it pays off. It cost me a small fortune in your station to find that out. Of course, I suppose all these people are accustomed to budget buying. Their lives are geared to it. Sure, but usually they dealt with some slick salesman with a honeyed tongue and collectors with brass knuckles. But you show them you're friendly and square, and you mean business, and they'll be square with you. Wait a minute. I have one here. There's quite a story behind it. One day, I was walking home from lunch with Ned Russell, our territory salesman. Well, sir, there at the curb was a car with the front wheels blocked up and two jokers prying off the tires. Some poor guy had missed his payments, and those shoppers weren't losing a minute repossessing the tires. Ned turns to me, kidding, and says, there's one budget buyer you better lay off. And so, just to top his gag, I left my card, inviting the poor guy to come in and see me. Didn't know whether he would, and I didn't really care much. So that very afternoon, the guy came in, kind of timid, scared, but hoping. I talked to him, not tough, straight. He had a record for good employment, was buying his own home, didn't seem to be in too deep in other obligations, so I put the question right up to him. He was sitting there, right where you are. How come you slipped up on your payments? Well, I just don't know. I honestly don't. It just seemed like when Friday came around, I was always a little short. I know that sounds silly, but that's the way it was. How often were you too short? Just a couple of times. First time, well, I made that right up. Second time, they didn't give me a chance. You saw what they did. Yeah, I saw it. I gotta use my car and my work, I gotta have tires. Yeah, and you have to pay for the tires too, you know. Sure, I know that. And I never missed a shot on any of our other accounts. But this, I don't know. When is your payday? Saturday. When do you usually pay your bills? A Saturday, if the place is open Saturday night. Uh -huh. Now, when do you prefer to make payments on these tires, uh, presuming we get together? Why, Saturday, I suppose, get it off my mind. Now look, I don't want to lead you into anything that you can't comfortably afford. I can afford those payments, all right, if... If you pay when you got the money handy, okay. I just want to see that everything is set that way. That you and I understand each other, right? Right. Oh, I'd say that was one to pass up. Oh, uh, you were overlooking the element of human nature. And it was human nature that had made him miss his payments before. Yeah, sure, you're right. After payday, he had plenty of money. But if he carried around in his pockets, it would melt away. And by Friday... Fooey. Mm, sure. Well, that's natural. But I made him set up the deal just the way he wanted it. Of course, I got a solid down payment with the odd cents, so he'd have an even two bucks a week. I went over every detail with him to be sure that he understood and he knew that I understood. And he was your lifelong friend. Till next payday. He hasn't missed a week so far. He knows I'm waiting for him every Saturday. Well, I'd even call him up out of bed if he didn't show up. On the other hand, if he left town today, I'd still be square with the board, counting the profit on his other business. But he won't walk out on this deal. As soon as he finished paying for those ties, he's going to buy a car radio. Say, that suggests something. You could sell accessories on that basis, too. Radios, heaters, seat covers. How do you suppose I topped you on accessories? Yes, sir, you can sell plenty of accessories that way. Yeah. This human nature is a wonderful thing. You bet. You play along with human nature and you're on the winning side. Oh, but shucks, why should I be telling you? You've been doing it for years without thinking about it. Well, all right. Now let's have the gimmick. The gimmick? That's right. Surely this budget selling isn't all sweetness and light. All right, it can go sour.
But if it does, it's usually because the dealer doesn't screen his customers enough to cull out the deadbeats. Then again, maybe his records are so loose, he can't keep a steady rein on his business. Or so complicated, they get out of hand. This is all I have. Simple enough to almost operate automatically. Yet complete enough to tell me everything I want to know every minute. It only takes a few minutes a day, and I'm always in the driver's seat. I'm still looking for the gimmick. Maybe it's the capitalization. You have a big business operation here. Oh, that coming from you, George, the expert who gave me the sharp lesson on big accessory business and small capital investment. I know, but this is different. Oh, nonsense. Look, I didn't go off the deep end first hop. I put my chips in carefully until more and more of these budget buyers were on the black ink side of their payments. Then after a while, I plowed all of the profits back into the operation. First thing you know, I was pyramiding the business on other people's money. Oh, that I like. Now, another thing, you can play it smart two ways. Be smart in selling and be smart in buying too. And always take full advantage of the quantity and cash discounts offered by the company. Remind me never to play poker with you. Probably talk me into lending you an ace so that you could beat my kings. Oh, it's just playing the angles, like buying trade-ins. Aha! Uh -huh. At last the gimmick. Those trade-ins. The problem children. Say, around here they're the fair-haired children. You can have them. You bet. The easiest way to sell a pair or a set of new tires and tubes is to buy the unused mileage on the old ones. Let me tell you about an experience I had. Ah, here she is. This gal is a visiting nurse. High mileage, low income. She dropped in today with a tire that was worn right down to the tube. It wasn't what you'd really call a sale. Had the money right in her fist to pay. Well, while Eddie was putting on the tire, I took a good look at the others. Two were good for about three, four thousand. One maybe half that much. I'm afraid before long you'll be having to have Hush, a... I know. That left front. But don't say it. It's just got to be all right, that's all. It'll have to be. Doggone shame. After all, your car is no more dependable than its worst tire. Now, it seems to me if I... Don't... Listen to me, Henry Morgan. I've got the money to buy one tire. A tire. The others will have to do. And besides, they have some miles left in them. Oh, sure. But suppose I bought those miles. Then the money you expected to spend on one tire, you could have new Atlas tires and tubes all around on our budget payment plan. Really? Sure. Well, that... Wait a minute. How much are you paying me? And how much am I paying you? It took a little selling, but that old human nature was all on my side. She wanted those new tires. And when I showed her how she could cash in on the remaining miles of the old one and keep her payments down around $5 a week, it was a deal. But what about the smarty shoppers, the guys that always have a friend who'll sell them a 100-level tire at a big discount? You remember that Phillips deal I spoke to you about? The guy who put the bite on me for a 15% discount? I got my full profit on that deal just by using my head and handling his used tires. Oh, well, maybe in one particular case. No, no, the trade-in is always your trump card. You use it as a clincher to make the sale, and you use it as a means of getting your full profit on every deal. Sounds more like giving away all your profit. Look, you take approximately $3 out on each tire. You give your customer, probably, a dollar apiece on his trade-in. And sell him for three seventy-five dollars apiece. Sure. Now show me the Indian rope trick. Sell dollar trade-ins for three seventy-five. That I want to see. Okay, my friend. You give me the answers. There are a couple of tires I took in for a dollar apiece. Now, what are they worth? To a sucker, seventy-five cents. To a junkie, two bits. All right. That's your figure. Come on. Now, what would you sell that baby for? Oh, four dollars, maybe four and a quarter. That's close enough. We get three ninety-five. Yes, but that's not the same tire as those you showed me. What do you say, Fred? Well, until we started work on it. Oh, well, but you've got to charge off the time that otherwise would be going to other jobs. <laughs> How about that, Fred? Strictly a spare time job. That's the boss's rule. We don't start work on this till the other jobs are cleared up. And they still have time to keep track of young Dr. Malone, John's other wife, and the baseball game. Come on, I want you to see my bargain display. Nowadays, my friend, we even take in trade-ins on trade-ins and making money on all of them. Here is our answer to chain store price competition. Retreads to compete with new tires. Say, which would you rather drive? A hundred level carcass with a good retread or an off-brand new tire that's shoddy all the way through? Sure, I know because I'm a tire man, but does the public know? They do if they're properly sold. 
We give every tire its best display face, whether it's a retread, regroove, or plain as is. Then we display them like bargains, price them right, people snap them up. Just that old human nature working again. We get the reputation of being quality tire bargain headquarters. After a while, today's bargain hunters grow into better jobs and more money. But they're still our customers to sell up into the more profitable business. Say, I think it's time to knock off. Come on over to the house. The missus is out of town, but I know she left a full refrigerator. Oh, I'll just go to the hotel. Nonsense, nah, you're coming with me. We got a lot to talk about. No, seriously, you better give me a rain check. I've got things to do tomorrow. Remember, this is a business trip. Like my trip to Center City? In a way, yes. I got all the breaks in that deal. I had a chance to watch you and your boys in action when you thought I was just another customer. <laughs> I got you with your guard down. Yes, I guess you did. Well, I'll just have to do the next best thing. What's that mean? What do you got in mind? Me? I don't know what you're talking about. Listen, Foxy, you got something in mind, and I'm not taking my hands out of my pockets until I find out what it is. Henry, you've just got an uneasy conscience, if any. I was just about to suggest that maybe I'd mosey around town in the morning, then drop in on you about lunchtime, that's all. Uh -huh. Riding on a broom, no doubt. Henry, you're a suspicious old devil. Listen, I tangled with you once before, and I was the sucker. But then, you got smart. Yeah, that's what I've been wondering. How smart? <laughs> hey, Fred, uh, I'm officially out this morning. If anybody comes in looking for me, or anything out of the ordinary happens, uh, tip me off, but keep it on the QT. You mean you're out, but you're in. That doesn't make sense. I know, but do it anyway. Say, boss, I don't know if this is what you had in mind, but... Yeah, what? Well, an old geezer came in looking at tires. Naturally, I gave him the pitch. First on a pair, then on a set with tubes on a turn-in basis. Yeah, yeah. Well, it just seems a little too easy. All I had to do was nudge him, and he starts falling for seat covers and maybe a radio. Uh-huh. Tell me, is he uh, looking for a budget deal? Yeah, so I tell him you're out, and he'll have to wait till you come in. Then he starts getting huffy, wants to know why I can't handle it. Hey, let me take a look. Well, I'll be a son of a gun. So that's his next best thing. Might have got away with it, too, if I hadn't been laying for him. The whole setup seems all right, yet it's just a little, I don't know, queer. You ain't kidding. It's as phony as a $3 bill. But you go ahead, handle the whole thing yourself. Oh, no, not me. Yes, you. It's a gag, see? Right along with it. Go ahead, let him have everything he wants. Listen, boss, you've been preaching don't take anything for granted too long. I know, I know, but this is different, believe me. Now, go ahead. Well, all right. This has got to be colossal. This has got to be something to tell his grandchildren. Uh, get me the police station. Uh, hello, is uh, Lieutenant Casey there? This is Henry Morgan. Uh, hello, Dennis. Look, you, you got to help me frame a friend. It's a phony arrest. Uh, you, you're a gag, see? Have a car tail him from here. And when he thinks he's away clean, nab him on the road. And lug him back with handcuffs on. Then toss him behind bars. After a couple of hours in the clink, I'll put on the big rescue. And the laugh and the beer will be on him. <laughs> sure, sure, swell. Well, he should be leaving pretty soon. Thanks, Casey. That's one for the book. A sweetheart. Mr. Morgan, the lieutenant says... Hi, boys. There's your man out there now. But don't let him know you're tailing him. Not a chance. We got the prowl car. Never know we're police till we hit the siren. Swell. Well, you know what to do. Well, sure. Uh, but are you sure that you want him brought in with the cuffs on? Absolutely. But watch him. He'll give you an awfully convincing story. 
but bring him in anyway. He's as good as in the cage right now. Hey, better get going. He's getting ready to leave. Come on, Joe. You should have been here. I just pulled a ticket. Wait a minute. What are you doing here? Didn't you? Weren't you in that car that just pulled out? Me? No, I'm here. Say, have you lost your mind? Oh. First a sucker. Oh, uh, get me the police department, quick. But when do I start to get smart? <laughs> and alibis are for the also-rans. The champion stands out by his performance. It's a long jump from the sports arena to your display room. But right here among the bread and butter items of the Atlas line of accessories are champions too. In fact, before they were privileged to bear the Atlas name, they had to prove themselves tops in the toughest kind of competition. For example, here's an Atlas muffler matched with a competitor in a deadly duel. There's no audience applause to spur them on, and they don't need it. This test is far more severe than the mufflers would have to endure even on a car being driven over railroad ties thousands upon thousands of miles. Here in the grim calm of the laboratory, results are checked exactly as the ordeal goes on and on. Meanwhile, other mufflers are being tested scientifically for operating temperature, for power-stealing characteristics of back pressure, for sound dissipation, and all other vital points of muffler performance. Let's go back and watch the finish of that test of sheer strength. Something's got to give before long. There it goes. And the winner, sure, it's the Atlas. In any test of brute strength, the heavy metal and husky construction of Atlas makes it a standout favorite. And as for the loser, well, see for yourself. In fact, you've probably seen this same knockout before in your own service station. Mufflers that have failed and had to be replaced after a relatively short period of strenuous service. Sure, that's fine. But most mufflers wear out from the inside. They'll rust out long before they break off. You're absolutely right. Every gallon of gasoline burned in an engine produces about a gallon of water from the condensation of the exhaust gases. When the exhaust line is equipped with a muffler of the ordinary type, some of that water is bound to condense in the muffler and collect at the bottom. Of course, if the engine is run long enough and hot enough, that water would eventually boil out. But most driving today is short hauls to the store, to the bank, to school, such low mileage trips that the muffler rarely gets hot. And from fall to spring, it hardly ever gets even warm. So the water just collects in the bottom of the ordinary muffler. Gradually, the muffler is eaten away until finally, bingo, it's a dead duck. You say ordinary muffler. All mufflers look alike. How is Atlas any different? Atlas mufflers have equalized heat distribution and positive turbulence. Ah, that's just a lot of words. Here, show me with this. Never mind the fancy talk. 
Well, that's fair enough. Now, if you could look inside that atlas, you'd see that it's equipped with a series of ingenious turbulence vanes. As the exhaust gases go through the muffler, a whirling action is set up which cleans out the water vapor before it has a chance to condense. Well, that sounds reasonable, all right, but... But what? Well, doggone it, I don't want to seem stubborn, but I'd like to see you prove it. Okay. I like you skeptics. You have to be shown, but you never forget. Here's an ordinary automobile engine with two mufflers attached. One's an Atlas, and the other's, well, one of your principal competitors. And that selector valve lets us put the exhaust through either muffler at will. Now, just to make this test more conclusive and demonstrate the comparative self-cleansing action of the two mufflers, let's pour 16 ounces of water into each one. Incidentally, that's just about the amount of water created by a two-mile drive. Most of the cars that stop at your station have carried that amount in their mufflers at one time or another. First, we'll turn the exhaust through the competitor. Okay, start the engine. Looks familiar, doesn't it? Sure, you see it again and again as cars pull out of your station. Now, let's see the Atlas in action. And there's real action. That's what we mean by positive turbulence. See how the action of the exhaust sweeps up the water and flushes it out. In slow motion, the self-cleansing whirlwind action is even more apparent, blasting out all condensation. Naturally, you'd never see this under normal circumstances, for the Atlas muffler never gives water a chance to collect. Well, I guess that's that. So let's switch back to the ordinary type. Give it a little more time, although it won't help much. Without the positive turbulence of the Atlas design, no muffler can have full self-cleansing action. So let's shut off the engine. Now for the final answer. How much of the original 16 ounces of water remains in the competitive muffler? Incidentally, if every motorist had to go through this, he'd sure learn a lesson. Let's take a close look. There you are, 14 ounces left. But how much is trapped in the atlas? Hmm, maybe that drain is plugged. No, dry as a bone. And a dry muffler is a clean muffler years longer. Now, does that answer your question? Mister, there just isn't anything more to say. Probably every dealer at one time or another has heard some customers say, Look, an oil filter is an oil filter. They all do the same job. What's the difference? Then what do you say? What can I say? What is the difference? Well, let's get right down to fundamentals. A filter can be no better than its element, and the element can be no better than the material it's made of. Let's compare an atlas with one of its best-known rivals. Your first impression is the contrast between the trim, sturdy design of the Atlas and the complicated structure of the other. But here's something more important. Let's take two new elements and immerse each in a jar of water and let them stand a while. Now let's examine them more closely. The Atlas element remains absolutely unchanged. But look at the linty fibers floating out of the other, lint that couldn't help polluting the very oil that filter is supposed to protect. Vigorous stirring has no effect upon the atlas. It still retains its original compact form. But just try that on the competitor and things begin to happen. With a little agitation, the element begins to disintegrate like wet cardboard. Too much like wet cardboard. The answer is, the atlas is made of a high grade of filter material impregnated with bakelite plastic which makes it impervious to water. Its competitor is made of, well, your guess is as good as mine. Now let's start over with two new elements and see what this means in actual service. 
This test apparatus duplicates the action of the oil system of an engine in such a way that you can see it in operation. As everyone knows, in winter operation, an engine precipitates a certain amount of water in the crankcase due to condensation. A lot more than this, actually. But this will give you an idea of what happens. The motor starts, and the oil begins to flow through the lines and through the filters. For the first couple of minutes, they seem to perform about equally well. And then, after five minutes, the oil stream through the rival filter is noticeably reduced while the atlas performs normally. After 10 minutes, that oil flow is about half normal, but the atlas is still functioning perfectly. After 20 minutes, the competitive filter has swollen shut, leaving the engine without any protection whatever. But the atlas still performs perfectly and will keep right on indefinitely thanks to its waterproof element. Now for the test supreme, the trial by torture. That horrid looking stuff he's pouring is the world's vilest gunk. It's the lowest dregs from the sludge of crankcase drainings, purposely refined to save only the worst. But look at it under the microscope and you'd find it's composed of metal scrapings, jagged particles of grit and carbon, sheer murder to any engine. Here in concentrated form is the reason why every engine needs an oil filter. And here is a test to prove the champion. The rules of the contest are simple. Just dose two samples of engine oil equally with that poisonous gunk and let the rival filters themselves prove which does the best job of purifying the oil. Let's stir it up too. All right, that's enough. There goes the bell and the battle is on. Almost instantly, the oil is transformed to a muddy stream of scouring abrasive, devastating to bearings, pistons, cylinder walls, valves, and all the other finely fitted engine parts. Second round. The two contestants appear to be about equal. As yet, there is no visible difference between the Atlas and its opponent. Third round. This may be the turning point. See, the oil in the Atlas filter bowl is beginning to clear. Fourth round. Now the Atlas is well out in front. Look at the difference and judge for yourself. Fifth round. This is the finish, and what a finish. The Atlas has transformed the contaminated oil back to its original clear body, while the competitor, well, you'll be the referee. Now we'll get the real inside story. Even with the naked eye, it is obvious that the Atlas is the standout winner. But to determine the exact margin of victory, let's see how much abrasive each picked up. On this laboratory scale, he compares a brand new competitive element with that which went through the test. The difference in weight is the foreign matter in the filter element. And remember that scale reading. Now the technician makes the same comparative test of Atlas elements. And that difference represents the additional amount of poisonous gunk trapped by the Atlas. And boy, what a difference. Which filter would you choose for your own car? Well, what's the answer? Is there any difference between oil filters? <laughs> oh boy, now I can really tell him. What you should know about this filter is... Remember those, oh, you know, the good old days when night driving was an unfunny game of blind man's buff and the feeble half-light of tarnished headlights? Then came the sealed beam headlights, which changed all that. Hey, wait a minute. I want to ask about that. Nowadays, all headlights are called sealed beam. But some are different from ours. They've got metal backs. How do those stack up with ours? Well, let's compare them in every way. What's the first thing you look for in a headlight? Why, lighting power, of course. All right, let's look in on this lighting engineer while he makes a comparative test between the all-glass Atlas and its metal-backed competitor. When brand new, both check about equally, as you can see by these light meter readings. 
That's our competitor. And here's the atlas. But there's one big difference, even at first. You'll notice that the atlas gives its full light with six amps, while the competitive light requires over seven amps. How come we got so much greater efficiency? Principally because of the greater efficiency of the atlas glass reflector, which is coated with vaporized aluminum in an exclusive process. What's so special about it? Well, this will give you an idea. See those little pieces of aluminum on the filament? Yeah, but... Keep your eye on them. See? Say! And there you have the most efficient reflecting surface known. Similar to that used on the mirrors of the giant astronomical telescope. Say, that's all right. But that's only the beginning. You want headlights that maintain their efficiency after months and years of driving in all kinds of weather. With that in mind, let's examine the two types of lights carefully. The atlas, you'll notice, is all glass, hermetically sealed in a single airtight unit. Its rival, however, is built with a rubber gasket as a seal, sort of like housewives use to seal their pickle jars. Well, so what? Just this. When lighted, every headlight heats up. Unless the seal is absolutely perfect, that heat causes breathing. Here, we're creating a sort of laboratory cloudburst to give you an idea of the importance of true sealed beam construction. Naturally, no car is driven underwater. But every car's headlights are subjected to the effect of rain, mist, changes in temperature, and such things. And what's the result? Well, in the case of the real sealed beam atlas, nothing. Because it's just as airtight as glass itself. It couldn't breathe. But in the case of the competitor, subjected to exactly the same treatment, it's a different story. See that water inside the lens? Another batch of pickles gone wrong. And that's the big reason for the big difference in sustained lighting efficiency. Whereas the Atlas True Seal Beam Light maintains practically its full brilliance throughout its entire life, its rival begins to fail from the first day of operation. And at half its life expectancy, it provides this view of the road ahead. Whereas with Atlas genuine sealed beam lights of the same age, this is what you'd see on that same stretch of road. Which lights do you want? <laughs> Guess there's only one answer. But here's something else. Those competitors claim that if our light gets cracked, it's all through. But if the other kind... Pardon me. Did you ever see a cracked Atlas seal beam light? Hmm, come to think about it, I guess not. Except maybe in a wreck. Well, let's try another little experiment. Not very scientific, but it is pretty spectacular. Here's the all-glass Atlas with its high-test, hardened Pyrex lens. Here's its metal-backed opponent with its ordinary soft-glass lens. Now to see which will stand up best under shock, we simply raise the pendulums and let nature take its course. Please notice that the atlas is still lighted. And the other? Well, does that answer your question? Well, I'll be doggone. Now take an accessory like seat covers in the luxury class. We're apt to think of them in terms of dressing up the car. This is the kind of service we like to think they get. And of course they do sometimes. But sometimes they have to take a beating too. Little Junior and his friend have long since learned that seat cushions make swell springboards. And who ever heard of kids who were careful to wipe their shoes? But that's not the worst of it. Ah, uh, I was expecting that. A nickel will clear up that face. But what about the seat cover? If they're Atlas, a wet cloth is all that's needed to make everything clean and bright as new, and incidentally, save a couple of kids from the hairbrush. We've learned to take this quality for granted. Just as we take for granted their protection when some careless motorist leaves his car parked with an open window in snow or rain. 
Maybe we even assume that all seat covers give this same satisfaction. Well, let's see. Now here are two samples of cover material which look identical. So we'll give them the same test. A gob of nice, gooey jam. The kind that belongs on bread, but sometimes unfortunately gets on seat covers. One yields quickly to just a damp cloth. Now I'll try the other. Go on, rub hard. Well, that's a little better, but still the stain remains. The jam soaked right into the material itself. With Atlas, stain and soil cannot penetrate the material because the fiber is impregnated with moisture repellent plastic, which also gives longer life to the trim Atlas fit, as this demonstration will prove. Both Atlas and the competitive material are dumped in water. Now watch this performance carefully. It will prove a point well worth remembering. Each is subjected to equal load simply by placing identical weights in their centers. After a few minutes, the difference in strength between the two becomes very apparent. The Atlas is practically unaffected thanks to its moisture protection. While the other, weakened by its bath, sags like an old-fashioned hammock. And that explains why Atlas seat covers, properly installed, continue to hold their shape long after others have taken on a tired, droopy look. Yeah, that's fine. But I know some people, women in particular, who say that seat covers are hard on clothes especially for coats. Ah, that brings up another extra quality feature of Atlas. Here's a sample of seat cover material as it comes from the loom. At this point, most makers would call it finished. To the hands, it feels like stout, serviceable material. Even to the naked eye, it doesn't look so bad. But under a magnifying glass, it shows up like a coarse file. Naturally, it's tough on clothes and especially fur coats. Atlas carries the manufacturing process an important step farther. After this material comes from the loom, it is refined between calendar rolls under terrific pressure. The naked eye shows you something of the result. But only under a magnifying glass can you see how smooth it really is. And only through direct comparison can you appreciate the full significance of this Atlas extra quality feature. Thus, beauty and utility are combined to make the Atlas outstanding for both comfort and protection of the modern motor car. Hi there, friend. What you got there? Just a fan belt. Just a fan belt? Why, yes. Yeah. How far could a car run without one? Well, not very far, that's sure. You bet. And when you stop to think about it, that belt's got a pretty tough job. Every minute that engine's running, the fan belt has to carry the power to cool the radiator, pump water through the engine, and charge the battery. It works right up against the hot engine block, taking the full brunt of power every time you stamp on the throttle. Out on the open road, it actually travels faster than the car itself because the fan belt drives directly off the crankshaft, which turns about four times as fast as the wheels. Wow. Say, on that basis, some of the Atlas fan belts I put on are running up 100,000 miles and more. Boy, that sure says a lot for our pre-stretched cord construction. My friends, you haven't seen anything yet. Hmm? Now you're going to see a real test of brute strength. We're throwing science out of the window. This was dreamed up purely as a display of sheer guts. Two of these mighty little jeeps are going to engage in a murderous tug of war. And right in the middle is a regular Atlas fan belt. Okay, boys, start the motors. Now take up the slack. All set. there. 
one Jeep stalled. Uh, say, look, son, why not use your four-wheel drive? Well, here we go again. And this time, it ought to be different. It won't be long now. But brother, think of the beating that fan belt is taking as those two mighty midget monsters buck and strain. And at last, the tug of war is over. All right, boys, you argue it out. The real winner is right here. That same degree of outstanding quality is characteristic of every member of the Atlas family of accessories. From a five cent fuse to a $50 radio, Atlas offers standout performance. And in this, as in every field of competition, when only one can be tops, it's performance that marks the champion. some distinguished citizen, as the stories say, who gets an honorary degree from a college, usually called a doctor's degree, and that's understandable. It's a kind of special recognition for someone who's proved he's an expert in his own right. Well, what about an honorary doctor's degree for some American drivers? Sounds crazy, you think? But why should it? there are quite a few who deserve some special recognition because they're real experts. It doesn't matter if you're one of the fair sex or a young fellow out for a spin with your girl. Maybe you're one of them. If you are, you always have safe, positive control of your automobile always ready for action before action is needed. Because you plan it that way. If so, driving is always a pleasure for you and your passengers. Whether it's a Sunday afternoon trip across town or a business trip on the highway. What makes an expert driver? Well, of course, you have to meet the physical requirements. Things like visual acuity, ability to pick out different colors, and reaction time. And anyone with expert ideas would certainly take every opportunity to test himself on these things. But as far as a diploma goes, there are two basic mental requirements. First, there's expert understanding about automobiles. That's simply knowing what an automobile is really for to get you wherever you want to be, safely, comfortably, and pleasantly. The second thing is something called driving perception. That's a little harder to explain, but it's easier to show in a kind of laboratory with our cameraman's help. All right. Driving perception is seeing, understanding what you see and anticipating whatever action the situation may require. This difference between just seeing and also understanding and anticipating is a good yardstick for measuring your driving skill. The camera can help us again. For instance, an expert driver perceives more than other drivers, not just ahead, 
but way ahead. And not just to the side, but all around it. He's constantly checking his awareness of the whole scene. So he's always aware of everything that's going on. He sees the car ahead of him, sure. But he also perceives one ahead of that. And another one approaching from the side. And he's always alert to what different things mean. He sees a parked car. And he perceives that with a driver, it could suddenly turn out. He's ready for action. He not only sees a traffic signal, he perceives waiting cars. That means the light might soon change, so he's ready. He's alert to different visibility at night, to weather conditions, and most of all to his own position in relation to other cars under all conditions. Let's ride with an expert driver and see good driving perception in action. In fact, let's go right where this perception takes place, in his mind. That's right. It looks like a view through the windshield. But now, we're seeing it in his mind. A doctor of driving has a special kind of picture in his mind. For instance, this car approaching the highway. The average driver only sees what is happening. But an expert driver also perceives what might happen. Isn't that right? Knowing this, the expert driver anticipates action. He adjusts his speed to take care of any situation. So he's not surprised at the last minute if the driver should fail to stop for a through highway. This ability to anticipate applies to every situation. Now, for instance, passing this car. Thinking ahead, a doctor of driving perceives it would be too close for safety. So, he waits and passes when he's sure of the situation. Isn't that the way you do it? Of course, this anticipating is especially important on hills and curves where you can't even see approaching cars. An expert just assumes they're there and insists on a full, clear view before passing. And that kind of driver is always anticipating in traffic. He's always ready for action before action is needed. As a result, he can take pride in his ability to make up for the bad driving habits of others. For instance, the lane hoppers who weave in and out of traffic. Their frantic antics just amuse an expert. And the paint scrapers who cut in on you because they haven't looked far enough ahead. Then there are those lovable characters, the brake braggers, who only believe in last minute stops. And at the other end of the scale, the jackrabbits, another familiar kind of jerky driver. And those armless wonders, even with direction signals, they figure their intentions are top secret or something. And we have the tail huggers, trusting souls who never figure you might have to make a quick stop. And the unofficial timers, they know how long a light stays green, but brother, how frequently their timing is off. Well, these driving curiosities never upset the expert. First of all, even with his understanding and perception, when a doctor of driving is driving, he concentrates on driving. But most of all, it's his attitude. He enjoys driving. He finds real pleasure in it. And he can always be proud of the confidence his passengers have in it. So he's a better driver than most people simply because he wants to be and maybe because he gets special enjoyment out of being an expert. And that's something extra. Maybe that belongs on the diploma too. For a doctor of driving certainly takes pride in his ability 
to master the situation, whatever other drivers do. But he's no show off. His pride is in driving so comfortably safe that only other experts ever notice him. And you know, that's really the only way to tell if you deserve a doctor's degree in driving. Having enough understanding, perception, and pride of your own to recognize other expert drivers and be recognized by them. If there were only more expert drivers on the road, wouldn't driving always be a tremendous pleasure for all of us? Now, uh, doctor, don't you agree? Thank you.